those who are in person as well as online. And yeah, Green, you are right. It's a different sound in here today. I hear myself a little more clearly than normally. Amen? Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it as we come to participate in this final Sunday in August. And how right for it to be a BAM Sunday where we acknowledge the men in our service, in our congregation, coming together to worship the Lord. As we stand now for our congregational hymn, Good morning, good morning. We are so excited to be in the house of the Lord yet again, knowing that we are just leaning on his everlasting arm. So I want you to put your hands together and enjoy in with us as we just speak about how great God truly is. What a fellowship, what a Everlasting God. 
Good morning, Second Mount Zion family and friends. I will read for your hearing today, Luke 7, verses 11 through 17. And it came to pass the day after that he went into the city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched. The blair. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there he came, and there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people, excuse me. <laughs> and this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. Amen, the word of God. Let us pray. Father, our Father, which art in heaven, Lord, we come first and foremost just to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Because of your omnipresence, Lord, we don't have to ask you to come by here because we know that you're already here, Lord. So right now, Lord, we say you are welcome, hallelujah, in this place. Let your spirit move in this place, Lord. Heal and deliver in this place. Lord, you are welcome to this service of praise. Lord, we welcome you to this service of Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Of uh, thanksgiving, this service of worship. Lord, we welcome you to this place. So just have your way, Lord. Move in the midst of your people, Lord, and just have your way in this place, in this service, in my life, in our lives, Lord. Just have your way in the name, in the mighty name, the marvelous name, the magnificent name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, Second Mount Zion. We greet you in that name that is above all name, a name that the Bible declares that every tongue must confess and every knee must bow. 
Amen. Jesus is Lord. Welcome, welcome to today's installation of our Sunday School lesson. Our Sunday School lesson as we continue in the book of Titus. And we have been exploring and we will close out this exploration on the topic of hope. Hope. Amen. How many know what hope is? Hope is found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we have been exploring. Amen. Just a few brief announcements before we get started. As always, we ask that you would send any of your mail correspondence, specifically your tithes, uh, to our post office box, which is P.O. Box 41839, Philadelphia, PA 191901. And uh, we ask for those of you who are in the sanctuary, if you would please refrain from eating or drinking. Uh, if you must, you can excuse yourself, go into the lobby and follow directions of our ushers and come back in. Also, our sick and shut list, as we continue to pray for those who are in our sick and shut ins, we ask if you or any member of your family takes ill that you would call, call the office and leave a message so that we can have confirmed knowledge. Amen. We also still uh, in that church anniversary, you know what pastor asked, what we ask of you, and we are efforting to fulfill our goal. Amen. And the only way we can do it is if you continue to participate in this. So we ask that you continue to give to our church anniversary. Although it was in April, we have set a deadline for the end of the year to make our goal and we are getting there and we still need your help so we ask that you would please continue to contribute uh, to that to make our goal amen and then we have a few upcoming events our annual gospel explosion which is taking place on october 5th right here at second mount zion amen and if you missed it last year we had a wonderful time in the lord we had some wonderful praise dancers and some ministry we've ministered in music amen from people from second mount zion and outside of second mount zion so we look forward uh, to having a wonderful time in the lord and if you want to participate and need to see more need more details please see sister dion amen and i think is that it for our announcements? That's it for our, hey, amen. Pastor would be happy. All right, all right. Let's let us get to our Sunday school lesson. As I said, we have been walking around talking about, and our overarching theme is hope in the Lord. Um, and over this summer, we have looked at the Christian hope both in this present age and in the glorious future that God is preparing. Stick a pen or underline future that God is preparing. Amen. And so we looked at and experiencing hope. We looked at that uh, through, through the lens of those of the early church and the New Testament. We looked at expressing hope from the perspective of the Old Testament of how expressing hope and, and where we land at today is an internal hope that we have been looking at from the books of First Thessalonians, First John, and the last two weeks, Titus, and the promised future that God is preparing for those who call on the name of Jesus. So what does hope look like as we wait for Jesus? Because you know that he is due back. Amen. He is due back. Now, let me say, before we get into the lesson, and I am grateful for all the folks that are here it is vacation season amen but there are people online that watch so i am grateful for those who are online but many times people will say you know they'll call me and say hey simpson that was a great sermon and anthony i have to remind them that you know i stand in the vein of like jimmy carter i'm just a sunday school teacher <laughs> Amen. So those are a lot. Don't tune out because there will be some preaching after me. Amen. There will be some preaching. I'm just like Jimmy Carter, a Sunday school teacher. Say what you want about Jimmy Carter. He was a Sunday school teacher in his essence. Amen. Amen. But I thank those of my friends who join online. I guess sometimes they're surprised. They see me here and some of the things that come out of my mouth, you know. Because before, I didn't always talk like this, Charlie. 
conversations was di- we had some different conversations. Amen. Well, thank God. And, 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 and Paul will help us out in this pastoral letter to Titus. So this is this 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 letter that Paul pens to Titus is one of his pastoral epistles that he writes somewhere after he gets out of prison. And he writes similar to how he writes to Timothy. And we're very familiar with Timothy and his writings to Timothy. And we're very familiar. But Titus had a special place in Paul because he was trusted. Amen. And we see today that in, if, if, and I hate to say it, but, you know, if, if pastor isn't here, don't, don't y'all tune out now, um, that we have some trusted people that can handle the load, amen? And, and Paul, and, and, and in, in the Christian ministry, we need trust, we can't do it all alone. We need folk that we can trust. And one of the people that we can trust and the most famous one that we hear is Timothy, but Titus, who this has this small book, was a trusted uh, friend who he entrusted with the work of the ministry, Paul did. So he writes this letter, uh, not so, not to correct anything that's wrong or correct any doctrine, because they were sound in doctrine. But he writes to encourage him, amen. And every now and then we need to encourage one another, right? And and Paul writes to Titus to offer some encouragement and wisdom, as he is the elder. And I talked yesterday, last week, about the elders, right? Our elders and the job of the elders is to encourage and to pull up those young folks, train someone to take your job. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but yeah. So, so he encourages him with wisdom. As Titus was undergoing or, or, or facing some opposition, right? He needed some encouragement. And some of, you, some of us need some encouragement because the week has beat us up. Amen. And we need, and you'll get some encouragement. I promise you, stay on. You'll get some encouragement. But Paul was, 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 was instructing him and encouraging him to complete his assignment, assign some elders. And he was saying this because, you know what, Titus, I, now I need you to move somewhere else. But I need you to put something in place, right? So if I go on vacation, everything ain't got to shut down. We can keep on rolling. He, he, he describes what type of folk he needed. Uh, that they should live in relation to each other and how their interaction should be with both believers and non-believers. And the proper Christian behavior is based on the fact that the grace of God, stick a pen in that, underline that, has appeared and has appeared to bring salvation for all people. Therefore, those who believe in Christ are to live self-control, upright, and godly lives as we await. So we are awaiting. We have an anticipated wait for something and many of us are afraid live like there's no tomorrow so when i look at this lesson if you frame it the situation is the grace of salvation or god's saving grace the complication the tense of this lesson is going to be distractions distractions and how many know distractions come from within and from outside amen all of y'all had had somebody, you know, you in church and you come and you ready to focus on the word and that person comes sitting next to you and want to tell you about what happened yesterday, what happened over the week, what happened in Real Housewives or whatever y'all look at. Yeah. Want to tell you about the football game. Want to tell you about the draft and who they should draft. It, distractions. There's time for that. But this couple hours we set aside it's set aside for worship amen so the gospel solution is that we need to focus focus on good producing good works but focus on what we were made for and i'll and, and i'll get into that so there's there's always conflict conflict is inevitable but paul will kind of help us out on how do we navigate that how do we navigate even in church conflict? In the church, conflict happens and things become distractions to us. How many times do we get caught up that we are so heavenly good that we, not, that we can't do any good on earth? We get caught up in uh, 
who going to do this, who going to participate in what, who does that, why did he pick that person to do it? These are distractions from what you, from what you need. So Paul will talk about, and what we'll look at is the inseparable relationship of doctrine and good works. Sound doctrine that expresses itself continually in good works. Because if you are Christian, I should know you are Christian, not by your name badge, not by what you wear, not because I see you with a suit on on Sunday morning, not because I see you, no shade, no shade ushers with your black and white on, and I know that you got some, that you got a job, not because I see you up here on the choir. I should know you by your works, right? What good, you know, when Jesus saw a fig tree and he was hungry and he wanted some figs, he expected that to go to that fig tree and get figs. And when that expectation wasn't met, Jesus cursed the fig tree. You have an expectation to produce some good fruit. What are you producing? Or as you, like Billy Holiday would say, producing some strange fruit. Some of y'all gonna get that. Y'all gonna get that when y'all leave, amen. But Paul, Paul, he gives us, he, he, he will talk about salvation. And salvation will give us hope for our future as well as our present status that we should be doing good. The scope of God's savings work we'll, we'll talk about. And a new beginning in, in this spiritual transformation that happens that empowers us to produce fruit. Because, and, and Green, I, I apologize to the booth, I ain't give y'all no scriptures today. So, so we just gonna have to, but I'm, the first scripture I wanna look at is Isaiah 43, seven. Because in order, you have to understand what were you created for? What is your purpose? The purpose of this podium is to hold something. The purpose of this microphone is to amplify my voice, right? And when it doesn't work, it's something wrong. When it's not operating in its purpose, there's something wrong. And so our purpose is that everyone that is called by my name, everyone that's called by my name, that I have, cre God created you. He created you, why? For his glory. He said, everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory and has formed him, yeah, I have made him. God made you for his glory. Now, let me ask you a question. What you did yesterday, did it give God glory? Please don't answer that. What you're going to do when you leave here, is that giving God glory? Hmm. Y'all can get quiet. That's all right. Just think. It's one of those things I want you to think. Amen. But you were created for his glory. So what are you doing that is giving him glory? When, when, when Paul writes this third chapter to Titus, his son, Paul comes to a point where he realizes or the awareness of what sin is. He realizes that we all have a past. Now we all sit here and we all saved and sanctified this morning, right? We've been delivered, hallelujah, right? But you are X something something. You did something something, right? None of us were perfect. None of us were delivered from, all of us were delivered from something. That's what salvation is about. Amen. But Paul, what he does is he acknowledges his past, but is not anchored to the past. But he uses his past to bring awareness to where, how far God has brought you. So when you get in those situations with somebody getting on your nerves, you can say, Lord, you brought me mighty way. Lord have mercy, you brought, because I wouldn't have did that about a, a couple weeks ago, a month ago, a year ago, I would have reacted, you brought me from a mighty way, I'm changed. Amen. But here Paul, in this awareness of sin, says, for we ourselves, and, and I don't know where Wilbur is, but he says we, uh -huh. 
he puts himself in this category. He's really talking about himself. For we ourselves were sometimes foolish. We too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passion and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Paul rattles off a list of sins, right? And Paul puts this up, because remember, Paul, who thought he was this highfalutin, reverent Christian who used his position to persecute folks, he, he, he weaponized religion, and he used that that he can persecute folks, and he just knew he was right until he met the risen, resurrected Lord and Savior. But he lists, but, but when I look at what Paul lists, he lists these sins. He says, I was a fool. How many of us played the fool at one point in time in our lives? I was a deceiving. I, I served lust and pleasures. And what Paul really deals with when he deals with these lists of sins is he deals with some root issues. Because many times we look at sin and the obvious sins when the 14 year old murders somebody, we, that's, that's horrible, yeah. it's a sin. But do we understand what goes on behind the scenes, the underlying issues of what led to that? Many times we don't even try to uncover why things happen. We just deal with the what happened, but we don't care about the why. What led this child to do this heinous act? Was it because he was, uh, had a broken family? What led somebody to get up at four or troll the streets in the wee hours of the morning breaking into cars? Is it because they had no food on the table? They had no, they had no perspective? So they figured they were painted in the corner, they had to do this? Paul goes to the inward part of sin. The inward part. He doesn't look at, you know, all right, the thief who stole. Yes, that's obvious. That's sin. But he goes to the inward. What causes that? The deceit, the feelings that you have, the lust, the desires, right? What, what, what causes these things? Because the Bible will tell us that, that when, when sin is conceived, or when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when it is full grown, it brings forth death. And many times we just deal with the latter portions of that, the sin and the death. But what about the conceiving part of it? Because if you can avoid the conceiving part, let me see if I can make that plain. I, I was in the store the other day and, and this lady, she was in front of me in the line, I was in the sneaker store. And she had bags, of sneak, like boxes of sneakers for her kids, right? Bunch of back to school shopping. And so she gets to the line and she says, she says, that one date night still costed me to this day. And she has bags of shoes that she's buying. And... and by the looks of it, it looks like it probably was multiple kids and, you know, they growing. And, and parents, you notice that, you know, it's that time of year when, when you buy sneakers and by Christmas time, they done outgrew them or tore them up and you got to do it all over again. So the frustration was from one, as she says, one date night that was conceived and led to this. Now, children are a gift from God, so now you deal with it. But had it not been conceived, maybe she wouldn't be complaining, right? And so had, had sin not been conceived, but here's what Paul says is that we have to look inward and deal with this from an inward perspective. And he looks at the lust and the pleasures and he, and he lists these things. And in and, 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 and Mark, Mark, Mark chapter seven, I'm sorry, Green, chapter seven, beginning at verse 20, and I'm gonna go down to 23. 
and, and, and you've heard this in, chapter, in Mark, what he says. And he says, what comes out of a man defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murder, thefts, covenants, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. These things come from within and defile you. But Paul realizes this, that, that, that he is a sinner. Do you realize that you're a sinner? And every now and then you got to look back on your past to see how far, yeah. see how much you've grown. Yeah. Maybe I should ask you, have you grown any? Christian, have you grown any? Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, and, he, and this is the we part, it will be if you listen, and this is the we. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world. His purpose was to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, do you think you're so good? Paul says, I am chief of these sinners. But Paul will tell you that, you know, he can run off his list of his resume. But at the end of the day, he's a sinner saved by grace. Okay, how many degrees you got? At the end of the day, you're a sinner saved by grace. And that leads us into, into the Christian and good works. And, we'll see, and what we'll talk about in these first couple verses, it's a doctrinal basis for good work. We'll, we look at the scope of the saving works. We see the, we see the awareness of sin, right? But after the awareness of sin, we see God's grace. But that after, and but cancels out in verse 4, after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by righteous works which we have done. You can't do anything. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing regeneration of the Holy Ghost. And this whole lesson can be summed up by one verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. And you know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? That we should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love was so much that he gave his last, his only. You ain't coming off your last and your only, right? God says, I'll give my last and my only, but this is going to come full circle. Stay with me. He gave it for a reason. He had compassion for someone. But look who he has compassion on. God so loved the world. He loved the world that didn't love him. He loved the world that rejected him. He loved the world that after he delivered them from Egypt said, I want to go back because I ain't got tomatoes. That's the world that he loved. He loved the world that when he saved them, delivered them, that they went and made a golden image. They cheated on him. He loved the cheater. He said he's married to them. That's the world that he loved. In spite of all that we did, even when he was moved to wrath that he was going to destroy the world, he says, I'm a save a remnant and, and, and rebuild it. He was within his rights to punish, but he loved so much. But why does he love so much? You can take a key from this. God's love is really self-love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, why? That we should not perish, but we should have everlasting life. He saved the world. What do we say, uh, call the worship? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world is God's. God is loving himself by loving us. It's self so if you can't love yourself, it's going to be hard for you to love someone else. If you can't love yourself, it's going to be hard for you to forgive that person. God can forgive because he loves. 
the essence of what God is, y'all gonna get this in a minute, is love. And because God has self-love, he loved the world so much that he gave, but he gave because the world is his and the fullness thereof, the earth. That's the world that we're talking about. Do you have self-love? If you can't love yourself, how are you going to love your neighbor? How are you going to love your family? How are you going to love your enemy? How are you going to do that? Maybe you don't want to do that. I get it. It's all right. It's not all right, but, you know, we're going to get there. That's a good question, Anthony. When? When? So he, 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 he loved us in spite of who we are. Isaiah 64, 6. In spite of who we are, God loves us. Isaiah says in that 64th chapter, in that 6th verse, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, I don't care how good you think you are, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. If I stick with Isaiah and I back up to the 57th chapter, the 12th verse, he says that I will declare your righteousness and your works for they will not profit you. You can't work your way to salvation. You want to impress God by what you do, by how many degrees you got, even by how many times you came to church. God says, I want to see your works on Monday. I want to see your works on Tuesday. I want to see how you act with folk getting on your nerves. I want to see how you act. That's what God is saying. And so here we have this, this grace that God gives us that results in some blessings. And Paul talks about this. Grace reserve, re, re, resulted in three blessings that he talks about here a rebirth and renewal, a new legal standing, and a new future. He says, not by works by which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have been reborn. Transforming of your mind, right? You are a new creature. He, baptism, when we talk about baptism, going down, dying to the old, coming up as a new creature, walking in this newness with Christ. Amen. Are you acting like you brand new? And I ain't talking about brand new like front. And I'm talking about brand new like, you know, you ready to go now. God has Give, and these are some features that you are renewed. And when you're renewed, you feel fresh. You know how you woke up from your sleep and you felt good. You woke up, you're ready to face the day. God has renewed you that you can face the world. Amen. He also gives you a new legal standing that being justified by his grace, we are made heirs. So he justifies us just as we did no wrong. That should make you shout right there because, you, because we all did some wrong, amen? We might have did some wrong a couple hours ago. But thank God, God looks at us as we have done, if you are his child now. He looks at us. And then he gives us a new future. We are made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you live for, what, what do you live for? And I'm afraid that many of our youth, if they don't have a hope for future, they're doomed for the present because they don't have heaven in mind. We live because we have an expected hope that even if the, let me see how I can put it, for those of us and even if we have to die, if we die in Christ, this is much hell as we would experience. But those who don't die in Christ, this is much heaven as they'll experience. Y'all get that later. And so the expected hope is that we hope for a future that has no end. That even where cancer can't affect us. Because I hear over there that Job says the wicked will cease from troubling. 
and I hear over there that there's a tree that's good for the healing, that you can pluck it off and you, I can, my knees won't hurt no more. I can wake up without knee pain. I can wake up without having to put my contacts on my glasses on. Amen. I can wake up and I not have to take my medicine every day. Every day. Every day. So here we come to verse 8 is the key for the book. It says, this is a faithful saying. And these things that I will affirm constantly, that they which believe in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are profitable unto men. So he first, he first tells you what's unprofitable. Well, he tells you what's profitable. Then we're going to get to the unprofitable. And I talked about distractions. Distractions are unprofitable. They yield nothing good. These things are profitable. So let me ask you, are you an asset or are you a liability? But these, these features that I will call it, rebirth, renewal, justification, new legal standing, a new f future, the benefit of that is that we, we are transformed and have a lifestyle that pleases God because you were created for his glory. So in pleasing God, you have an expected hope, an expected future. Amen. And so we look at these keys. He says, this is profitable. Is what, you, is, what are you doing that is profitable to God? These things are profitable. But then he goes on to talk about the unf unprofitable. And he says, avoid <laughs> foolish questions genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, for these are unprofitable and vain. Those, those conversations, distractions, who's going to serve what? Who's going to do it? Why did he pick her? Who's leading the song? Why ain't I leading the song? All those are unprofitable. They don't profit nothing. They don't serve God at all. And what Paul is saying, and he gives you some keys to what to avoid, is that you need to avoid these conversations. But many times we participate in the conversation. Right? Somebody sit next. These are the distractions, the church distractions. Right? Somebody sit, sit next to you and want to gossip about, you know, who came in with who, who left with who. Who posted what on Instagram yesterday? Who posted what on Facebook? And it's always, and I find this funny, it's always that folk will come at you right when it's time for preaching. They want to talk to you. Right when the teacher's up teaching, they want to, hey, did you, did you hear? But if we participate in that, we are just as guilty. So what Paul says is he says, Avoid these things. They are unprofitable. They are, avoid the distractions because they are useless. They are unprofitable. Now, you might find it profitable for your entertainment, but we are not here for entertainment. Now, I don't know why you came. Amen. Amen. He tells you don't have anything to do with that. How do you deal with false, and this was the problem that Titus was facing, was false teachers that were in the church and they were leading folk astray. These false teachers, first of all, you got to teach sound doctrine. And they were sound in that, but we have to stay focused on doctrine. That's profitable. Doctrine is good for reproof, correction. That's what it's good for. Stay close. And then he says to encourage some folk. Have you encouraged anybody? Sometimes we encourage folk not to come, unfortunately. But I'm talking about encouraging folk, saying hi, not dealing with who did, who said what, and all that gossip, but hi. How you doing? Welcome. 
a smile. You know, many of our new members, the reason that they come and they say, and shout out to the ushers, and where's Angie, the greeters, is that they say, somebody greeted me. Somebody was nice to me. You know how far a simple hello will go? Now, if you got a little funky attitude, maybe that day you should, you know, play the back a little bit. Because that's infectious. But the same way a great attitude is infectious. The same way a smile is infectious. Because you never know what folk walk through that door, what they're going through. Right? We are all sinners, and here we are, here to take our sin treatment. And maybe we should give it with a, a bit of honey and not a lemon. And when you had that sour face or when you had that nasty look on your face and when you don't smile, people see that. And everybody has a bad day. Everybody has an off day. Amen. But that comes with having to look within. And that's what Paul told you is that he looked within and seen his sin. He says, I'm a sinner. Raise your hand. We all sinners. As far as we done came, we all going to slip up. We all going to do something. Amen. But the point is, how do you rebound? And Paul says, this is how I deal with it. I, I'm aware of my sin. I'm aware of my grace that God gives me. But I have a hope. And if we have a, if we're living for not today, or as, who was it, Charlie? Living for the weekend? Yeah, yeah. I know something about that, living for the weekend. Amen. Weekend is only a couple days. You got the rest of the week. Amen. So Paul wants us to be an encouragement. Be an encouragement to someone. Amen. I, youth is coming. Good morning, SMZ. Good morning. Today's lesson is called Salvation, Who We Were, Who We Are, and Who We Will Be. Like Today's lesson was in Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to 11. Titus was writing a letter to Paul, and in this letter, Titus in the letter talks about salvation. And here are the first point is, here the first point is who we were. So before salvation, humanity was very messy and raunchy and ghetto. <laughs> And God could, have been, God could have been done with us, but because of his character and because he loved us, he showed us mercy. Our second point is who we are. Because God chose to save us, he made us new. We are his children. We are covered and protected. And it is not because of who we were, but because of his love for us. We are also guided by his Holy Spirit. Our third spirit is who we will be. We must... We must, focus, we must be focused on eternal and external growth. Internal, internal is building your growth with God by praying and getting closer to God, getting to know his character. And external growth is his fellowship. His fellowship is with his people. Um, living a life that pleases God and letting the Holy Spirit guide you in situations and people that are not um, Christ-like. All right, how many of y'all are excited to be in the house of the Lord? All right, come on, how many of y'all are excited to be in the house of the Lord? This is a very simple song where it talks about what we command our bodies to do in order to give God the praise due unto him. So we want you to just clap your hands because we're going to command our hands to worship God today. So come on and command your hands. I want you to command your hands to worship God. Some of you, come on, y'all, command your hands to worship God. Come on, there's still a few of us that need to command our hands. If it's clapping your hands, if it's waving your hands, regardless of what it is, I want you to command your hands to worship God today.
I command my hands to worship him. 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 I command my hands. I command my voice to worship him. 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 I command my voice I command my feet to worship him. I command my feet to worship him. I command, I my, command feet. my feet to worship him. I command my feet. I command my feet to worship him. I command my feet. I command my feet to worship him. I command my feet. I command my feet. Now pray my I command my hands to worship him. I command my hands to worship him. I command, I command my, hand. my hands to worship him. I command my hands to worship him. I command my hands to worship him. I command my hands.
Give him glory. Give him glory. Hallelujah.
just to see you to be hold you as my king I want to be where you are how many just want to be with gotta be where you are just say that to yourself I want to be where you are decree and declare it I gotta be where you are I want to be where you are I gotta be where you are Jesus whatever it is you want me to do wherever you want me to go I gotta be where you are. I wanna be where, I wanna be where you are. Oh, I gotta be, I where. Gotta be where you are. Just dwell in this presence. I wanna be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen. amen. One more time for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, Dirk, you're right. It does sound different up here. I, I, <laughs> I got to get accustomed to these, these speakers being powered behind me. But just a reminder, I, I know Simpson was up here last week, and he was talking about his Apple product. And, yeah, I did catch him online saying that, you know, we were going to give some instructions via the Apple product. But... Trust and believe that all the snippets you're going to see from today's video is from an Android product because we don't allow Apple in my house. <laughs> but just a friendly reminder for everyone, Easy, Easy, Tie, Easy Tie is changing their platform and as a result will cost the church a little bit more to continue to run using Easy Tie. Therefore, we are swapping over to Givelify. Now, I do see that some folk did swap over 
Praise the Lord. Thank you for you. There's still some folk that's using Easy Todd. And I'm not going to look you in the face, but all you got to do is just shake your head because I know. <laughs> so right now we're just going to show some instructions. We're, we're not going to turn off. We're not going to turn off Easy Todd just yet. I'll wait for everyone to transition over. Um, I'm going to send a friendly communication out this week, kind of giving some instructions on how to swap over. But right now, Kelly is starting without me. So installing the app. Let's go. Uh, we're going to go to the Play Store, the App Store, the app store for, for Apple products and uh, <laughs> from your applications menu. And there we're going to search. I think Apple has a search on the bottom right, um, something like that. But click on search from the App Store. And then once your keyboard pops up, you're going to type in and search for Givelify. And it's going to, uh, it's a nice orange app with the word give in it, and it's named Givelify Mobile Giving App. From there, we'll click on install. I know Apple kind of got that little blue cloud of death that just spins until the app is finished downloading, but Google products, you should be done just like that. <laughs> Step two, setting up the app. So once you have it downloaded, just go ahead and open the app. And you'll get a nice little intro video here. I think it's the same for Apple products too. Uh, click on get started once this pops up. Uh, once that pop, once you click on get started, you're gonna have a couple of prefer preferential options. One is the locations, the other is notifications. So that's up to you. If you want to turn your location on when using that, feel free to. If you want to get notifications from me, yeah, feel free to. Once it's open, search for Second Mile Zion in the search bar. And I haven't checked, but I'm hoping the other Second Mile Zion was deleted. If not, make sure you're you're, you're selecting the Second Mile Zion with the purple and gold logo. And when you click on it you're going to see the, a picture of the front of this church versus the old one will show a picture of the church prior to us having a remodel. Um, click on my place of worship, and then from there you can join or sign in. Now, if you have previously signed in before, um, well, well, I'll follow the instructions here. So let's continue with the email. And after you type in your email address, you're going to click on next. Now, if you've been prompted here before, you're going to get a pop-up, which is on the next screen, saying, let's get you signed in. Um, or the top says, we remember you, let's get you signed in. Now, if you don't know your password or don't recall your password, just click on forgot password and then you'll follow the instructions from there. But if you haven't, uh, ever, if you never signed up for Givelify, it's going to ask you for your full name. So you're typing in that box. After that, you'll type in a password. Make sure it's a password that you can remember, but difficult enough for somebody else to figure out, unless you want somebody given on your behalf. And click on next, and then after you do that, you'll click on dismiss. Now the final step is just giving from the app. So we installed the app, we set up the app, and now we're ready to give. So once we are back on this screen, we just click on the orange button that says give. And from there, you'll select your gift amount. Now, they have preset amounts there, but they also have the other button that you can click on as well, just type, type freehand. After you select your amount, click on the fund category, and then you wanna confirm the amount. So right, and for this example, I've got ties for a total of $100. Now, one thing that Easy Tie didn't allow us to do is give multiple, multiple um, gifts for one transaction. So for those that give to tithes, building fund, church school, and all that stuff, you can give all here before hitting the give button by clicking on add donation, um, which after, after the tithes and $100, you'll see the add donation to the bottom left. And then um, you'll select another amount, and then you'll select the category that it's going for. Then you'll do that again until you fill out all the categories you typically would give to. And then once you're complete, you'll click on give to submit the donation. Now, I like an app that kind of gives you multiple stops to, or multiple turns to figure it out right. You still have, well, for the first time set up, you'll fill in your card information and then click on next. Unlike Easy Tide, it does not take the bank account, so you do need card information here. And then fill in the address box, your mailing address box. 
And then this is your final chance to just confirm the amount that you give. So it gave you kind of two or three stops where you can kind of make sure that you're given the right amount or if you made a mistake to kind of go back and, and restart. And then you'll click on the give button and then your donation will be complete. You'll get a nice message saying, hey, thank you so-and-so for your gift, your donation. Um, and then you can keep that as your receipt. But of course, all the receipts will be stored inside your phone. Amen? Of course, I'm available at the service if anybody, if anyone needs any assistance. Um, I do appreciate the number of folk that did transition over already. But for those that didn't, expect a friendly email from me this week, pretty much giving you some instructions on, friend, very friendly email from this week, give, giving you instructions on how to transition over. And then I'll also leave my number in the email just in case you need to give me a call and you're having hard times. Amen? Amen. Turn it over to the choir. The run on it's gonna be I believe I'll run on see what the end's gonna be believe I'll run on see what the end's gonna be I believe I'll run on see what the end's gonna be let me tell you children child declare I believe I'll run on. See what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll run on. See what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll run on. See what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll run on. See what the end's gonna be. Let me tell you to me. I started out to heaven Hallelujah. a long time ago. Hallelujah. Ever since that day, Hallelujah. I had pain and woe. When I'm too close now, Hallelujah. Lord, turn around. Because I've got business on a high, high ground. I believe I'll pray to oh. see what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll pray to oh. see what the end's gonna be. Pray on. See what the end's gonna be. Let me tell you, children. Long he bent, long white road, way he bent for me. See, I started out for heaven Hallelujah. a long time ago. Hallelujah. Ever since that day, Hallelujah. I have painted it woe. Hallelujah. Well, I'm too close now. Hallelujah. Lord, Turn around, Hallelujah. cause I've got business on a high, high ground. I believe I'll sing, oh, see what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll sing, oh, see what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll sing, oh, see what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll sing, oh, see what the end's gonna be. Let me tell you, children. I went to the water, Hallelujah. the water 
was cold. Hallelujah. Until my body, but not my soul. Well, I'm too close now. Hallelujah. Lord, turn around. Hallelujah. I've got business Hallelujah. on a high, high ground. I believe I'll run on. See what the end's gonna be. I believe I'll run now prayer time as we stand and gather at the throne it was the woman with the issue of blood who knew that if she could just get to Jesus and even just touch his hem of his garment that she could be healed the centurion knew that even Jesus would just speak a healing, that his servant would be healed. And today is similar, that if we just come to Jesus, have a little talk with Jesus, that he can fix it, that he can heal it, that he can make it all right. So as we look to the Lord, God, you are our refuge, you are strength, and a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Lord God, you have not given us a spirit of fear. So Father God, we come now, Lord, Ever so thankful, O oh Lord. We're thankful, O oh Lord, that you are a God who loves us in spite of our actions, in spite of our behaviors, in spite of who we are. You just loved us. You loved us enough that you sent your only begotten son to deliver us from the pains of sin, to give us an expected hope, an expected future, where the wicked shall cease from troubling. Where, Lord God, there's a tree over there planted by the rivers that I can pluck off a leaf that will heal all manners of diseases, O oh Lord. So, Father God, we're thankful for the hope that you have given us. We're thankful for the Savior that you have given us that has saved us and renewed us, O oh Lord. We're thankful, O oh Lord, for the provisions that you have provided us, O oh Lord, that we can slumber and sleep while you just watch over us, O oh Lord. So, Father God, right now, as we stand here ever so thankful, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would just right now strengthen us. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would come down and be in the midst of us right now. Make your presence known right here, O oh Lord, as we lay our burdens at your feet, O oh Lord, that, Father God, while we struggle with the cares of this world, 
while we struggle with sickness, while we struggle with disease, while we struggle with finance, while we struggle with relationships, whatever the struggle is, oh Lord, we know that you can handle it because you can do everything but fail, oh Lord. So as the centurion and as the woman with the issue, here we are, your faithful servants, coming to the master who knows us well, coming to the one that can do everything, oh Lord. So Father God, we ask, oh Lord, that you would just touch, help the bereaved, oh Lord, that could get through the season that they're in. Help the sick, oh Lord, in this season of sickness, oh Lord, that Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you would just move in a mighty way, oh Lord, that when mountains get high, Lord, that you would move them, oh Lord, that you would push them down. When the valleys get low, Lord, that you would reach down and lift us up, oh Lord. Give us the courage, give us the knowledge, give us the wisdom, give us the understanding, oh Lord, that we can face tomorrow. But Father God, right now, tonight, today, this hour is an hour of renewing. Pour into us right now these empty vessels of yours, oh Lord. By the aid of your Holy Spirit, quicken within us, oh Lord. Touch us and move in our hearts, oh Lord that we can be ever so careful and that, that we can be obedient to your word, O oh Lord. And by our obedience that we will show you glory, O oh Lord. That we have faith in you, O oh Lord. No matter what the news says, no matter what the doctor says, whatever the prognosis is, we put it in your hands, O oh Lord, because we have faith. And even if you don't make the outcome what we want it to be, we ask that you would strengthen us, that you would get us through that, O oh Lord. Lord God, Paul says, remove this thorn, but if you don't, it's enough that I can carry on. Allow us to carry on in spite of whatever the day may bring us, O oh Lord. Allow us to be able to be good Christians, O oh Lord. Allow us to be able to train someone else, O oh Lord, that someone else that we can talk to. Have your way in this assembly, O oh Lord. We're grateful, O oh Lord, for your manservant that you have placed in this vineyard. And even in his absence, O oh Lord, we carry on because your presence is here, O oh Lord. So we ask that you would bless him and bless his family in a mighty way, O oh Lord. We ask, O oh Lord, as he's in a season of refreshing, O oh Lord, that you would allow him to be even renewed, O oh Lord, regenerated, and that your mercies will continue to fall fresh upon us all, O oh Lord that we can meet tomorrow. We're thankful, oh Lord. We're grateful for what you have done. But we know you have a mighty work to do right now, oh Lord, because we trust in you, because your pattern is love, and you gave that we should have. And our response is that we're going to love you back. So we love you, God. We love you right now. And because of our faith, O oh Lord, we pray that you would give air to the words and the meditations of our hearts, O oh Lord. Beseech us for right now, O oh Lord, that we beseech you. We pronounce healing upon that sickness, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, that name that is above every name. So as we continue now in this service, have thine way. These and all the things we ask in your son, Christ Jesus, let the church say amen. 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 amen and amen. 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 We're going to get to it, bro. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get to it. My bad. But before we get to that, amen. Church still goes on. And in the church school lesson, we learned that Paul had appointed folk for the church business to go on. And in the absence of our pastor, he has appointed someone so that the word can be brought forth. And we're ever so grateful for the talent that we have within Second Mount Zion. So after the hymn of meditation, the next speaking voice you will, be, you will hear is none other than our very own Chris Dixon, who will deliver the word. So we ask that you would greet him in a second Mount Zion way. Hey! Preach, Minister Chris.
पीछे वो Say that one more time, this one. Help me this morning. Lord, 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 I... Ah. Oh 
me, O Lord. The angels in heaven and sign my name. Yeah, 
Lord, right now we thank you. We thank you for another opportunity to come together. Father, right now we pray that you give us knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge enough that we may have wisdom to refer back to your word in Jeremiah and allow your words to be in our mouth so that the world may hear from heaven and live thereby. It is in Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. We greet you this morning in the name of Jesus, who truly is the Christ. We thank God for our pastor in his absence to be able to stand and proclaim the word of the Lord. We want to thank Pastor, Reverend, Doctor, President, Sunday school teacher, Deacon Simpson for that Sunday school lesson. And there is a word from the Lord. Luke 7. Luke 7, the biblical physician. Verses 11 to 17. Thank you, Ms. Dawn, for reading. And it reads as thus. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was, with, she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the briar, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a, pro a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God had visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And if you think with me for a few thoughts this moment, dealing with ugliness, at the gate of beauty. Dealing with ugliness at the gate of beauty. The world tells us that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And the beholder is defined as one who sees or observes a certain thing. And this morning, I just want to invite you to observe this present day, August 25th, 2024. For if you are alive and air is in your lungs this morning, any person with eyes can see that we're living in some ugly times. And as we prep, for back to school, I can remember my nerves during this time, getting prepared to go back and encounter another year of school, another year of peers, another year of learning. It always got to me. It was always something that my nerves just couldn't shake the pressure of learning new lessons and remembering the things that you had learned in years before, it did something to my nerves. And they teach us that your primitive learning years are from your birth 
until age eight. Those are the years that they say that your brain is formed the most and you start to learn the most that you retain throughout your life. And I can remember back in preschool, we had Ms. Miles, Ms. Dupree, Ms. Rucker, and we did things like play games like red light, green light. We did things like play games like uh, a duck, duck, goose, and, and, and moving from musical chairs and things of that nature. We learned our ABCs. We learned our one, two, threes. We went to lunch at a certain time, and at that age, almost every lunch was a good lunch because you haven't experienced many food options at that point, so lunch was a great time for us. And then if, if everything played out right throughout the school day, we get the opportunity to wind down and watch some Michael Jackson videos. And that was where I learned some of my best Michael Jackson moves that I still got till this present day. These were our informative years. But they also did something else for us. They reinforced some things that we were learning at home. They taught us again how to say yes and no. They taught us how to say please and thank you. They taught us how not to touch things that did not belong to us. They taught us how to raise our hand and wait until you were called on before you began to speak out. They kept us on a time schedule. They made sure that throughout the day, we did things at a certain time so that we had an understanding of how important organization was for our lives. But now, now in these present times, we hear things like what? We hear things like gimme. We take things that we want that don't belong to us. We speak over other folks before they can finish their thoughts. We do what we want to do when we want to do it and can't nobody tell us any different. I'm here to tell you this morning we're living in some ugly times. Our country has failed our students. Pennsylvania has failed our students. Philadelphia has failed our students. Teachers have failed our students. But let me stop right there. Because I want to suggest that maybe, just maybe, the failure started at the house. You can't reinforce something in a school that isn't being enforced at the house. We send these children off to schools and think it's the teacher's job to teach them everything that they need to learn. But at home is where it all begins. I hear the Bible saying, train up a child in the way that he shall go. And when he is old, he shall not depart. It needs to be some enforcement in the home. There needs to be some things that we teach our children that when they go out, the world is reinforcing what we have instilled in our children. We need to make sure that it starts at home. But church, we are not off the hook. We are not absolved. Because last I heard, the church was the pillar of the community. The church was a place where we all came together to experience God and hear from God. I can remember being in the church as a young boy. There were some people who just used to get on my nerves. And those people got on my nerves because they had a relationship with my family. And if they saw me doing something that they knew my family didn't teach me, the phone would ring. And they would say, did you know Chris was running around doing something that I know is contrary to what you have taught him? And just from a look, 
while they were on the phone. I knew that trouble was headed my way. And church, this morning, I'm here to say that the pillar that we should be is starting to diminish piece by piece. We don't want to have a relationship with our fellow churchgoers. We allow them to raise their children on their own. You see the helpless look of single mothers and kids who have no guidance, and we walk right by them. We don't want to tell them not to do this, or you should do that, because we're in fear of what the encounter with the parent may be. And I'm saying that when you come into this place, it ought to be a place where those who know better show better. It ought to be a place where those who do better can teach others the things that Christ has taught them. We are not absolved. We are supposed to be the pillar of the community. We're supposed to be the place where people come to learn and hear about the goodness of the Lord. We don't care about what happens on the outside that has nothing to do with your Christian journey. You can tell me that at the lunch table. But when you come in here, I should hear about the goodness of the Lord in your life. You should be able to give me something that I can glean on, that I can take with my Monday, use for my Tuesday, and keep me prepared for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That's what the church ought to be. We shouldn't be a L platform experience. A L platform experience. Anybody ride public transportation? Forrest Gump's mom will put it this way. The L is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And far too often, people come into the church and they never know what they're going to get. It should be a reasonable expectation when one walks into the church that not only they learn and hear about God, but they see some people who are striving to be like God. That needs to be a reasonable expectation. But contrary, we are not God. We are not God. Every saint has a future and every sinner has a past. Oh, don't sit there so quiet, act like you don't know what I mean. Don't act like you don't remember those Hennessy late night rendezvous. Don't act like your main girl's name wasn't Mary. Don't act like you didn't run the streets to and fro and show up here on Sunday morning look like half past death. Don't act like you don't have a husband. You're actually right because the five that you had prior to wasn't yours and the one that you got now ain't yours. You need to remember where you were when God picked you up and turned you around and planted your feet on a solid rock to stand. You ain't God. You ain't God. This needs to be a place a pillar of where people can come. And Jesus, Jesus, he teaches us in this lesson how to deal with ugly times. Here it is, here it is, Jesus. He's leaving Capernaum, and he shows up at the gate of this city called Nain. And Nain being interpreted means beauty. And Jesus, he shows up, and directly in the midst of this beautiful, beautiful city, he observes an ugly scene. And for this lesson, I want us to start by observing the witnesses. <laughs> Observe the witnesses. There are three groups of witnesses here. The first group is those with the widow. The Bible says that many of the people of the city were with this widow. The Bible says that these people 
were there with her. And I'm here to tell somebody that this group, this is their routine. That routine is that when somebody dies in our city, we come together and participate in their grief. And some of them came because they cared about this widow and the situation she was going through. And some just came to be participants in what was going on. But this group of people were those who had a routine. This was their routine, and they participated in her grief out of either care or obligation. But you got to beware of those who are just there. Just there tells you what you want to hear. Just there tells you what they're thinking. Just there people tell you what they have heard. It may sound good, but it can't help you in your ugly times. These just there people are people that we tend to lean on in our ugly times. Not because they give us sound advice, but because we know that they're going to soothe our ego. They're going to tell us things that sound good in a moment. They're going to keep us in the mind state that we're in, but they can't help us address the ugliness of the situations that we're handling. This is their routine. They know that when you get in trouble, you're going to call. And they know exactly what you want to hear. And they know exactly what to tell you. The Bible says that people will have itching ears in the last days. And I'm afraid that too many of us want to be around some people who are just there. People who are just part of that routine to take your call. It's like, mm-hmm, girl. Yeah. I would have did the same thing. Mm Mm-mm. They tried you like that? Now you know. Well, what you going to do? Yeah, that's what I would do too. It's a routine. It's only a part of their fiber, and they're going to give you exactly what they feel like you want in their ugly moment. But rest assured, it does not address the ugliness of your situation. These people who were just with her, participated in her grief, but did not have a solution to her problem. The second group is a little hidden. We gotta go back to Luke 6, 13, to really find out who this second group is. Luke 6, 13 says, and when it was day, he called to him, unto him his disciples. And of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. This second group is called disciples. Mathetes in the Greek, meaning a learner. This group of people are ones who come to see Jesus. Let's follow this group, this this group of people. They came to see Jesus. They know what his reputation says about him. They watched him heal the sick with the palsy. They watched him heal the man with the withered hand. They watched him defend his disciples against the scribes and the Pharisees. They watched him heal the centurion's servant. They watched him do all of these great things. And maybe, just maybe, there's somebody here who came to see Jesus. They came to see if he can heal that broken household. They came to see if he can heal that broken heart. They came to see if he can fix their broken finances. Somebody here just came to see Jesus. They want to see Jesus in the fullness of his power. They want to see if what you've been talking about is the real deal. They want to see this Jesus that you have been proclaiming on the street. They want to see him with their own two eyes. We need to set the atmosphere when people can come see Jesus, where people can experience Jesus for themselves. This second group came to see Jesus. 
They had heard about who he was. They had heard about what he had done. And they had an earnest hope that just by following behind him, they would see something that they had not seen before. They may see something that they may be able to use in their life. They may see something that would be life changing. They may see something that they can take back to the community. These folks came to see Jesus. They wanted to see what it was like up close and personal. They came to see the miracle worker. They came to see the way maker. They came to see the one who they say was coming to redeem man. This is the second group of people. We see that, that this second group also had the uh, apostles. The second group also had the apostles. Now the apostles are sec separated from the disciples. The disciples are learners, pupils. But the apostles were called directly by Christ. This Greek word is apostolos, meaning delegate, a messenger, one who has been sent with a specific message for your life. And far too often, we spend too much time with those who are just there. And not enough time with the apostle. Now, I don't mean apostle in the setting of being with the risen Lord. But I mean apostle, those who've been sent with a message from on high. An apostle, one who can give you a word for your ugly situation. An apostle, one who can tell you weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. An apostle who can tell you the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. An apostle who can tell you that he can pick you up, turn you all around. He can plant your feet on a solid rock to stand. An apostle who can tell you that it was at the cross, at the cross, where they first saw the light and the burdens of their heart rolled away. It was there by faith they received their sight. And now, and now, I'm happy all the day. You need some apostles who can give you a word from the Lord. You need somebody to tell you, hold on to God's unchanging hand. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You need to follow this third group. Yes, sir. This third group, the apostles, are the ones we need to lean on. This third group, the apostles, are the ones who've been sent from God. This third group, the apostles, have the words of God for your life. But less, I'll leave you there. Less, I hold you too long. You can observe, finally, the whosoever. The whosoever, can it be observed in this text? This is the only area of the scripture where this woman is mentioned. And you would think that Luke would mention her by name. But Luke, being a doctor, was very strategic. He left her name out of the text. He told us she was a widow. He told us she had lost one son. But he did not give a name. He didn't give a name because he wanted you to put your name there. You can put your name there because she's not the only one that had to lean on Christ after everything was gone. She had to lean on Christ in her ugly situation. She had to lean on Christ because he was the only one that can give her back anything that mattered in her life. Yes, sir. He worked 
to show that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He worked to show that the Lord is the Lord on the Sabbath day. He worked to heal a centurion servant, a centurion who had helped build a synagogue. And now he's here working for a little old nobody, a woman who has nothing left. And you can put your name in her spot because I heard the Bible declare, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here it is, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. She didn't allow her emotions to dictate her actions. You never been to a black funeral? You get a lot of criers in the front row. The family is emotional because they have a loss. And we hire these funeral homes to work on our behalf. And normally when you get a rowdy family member, when they're just getting ready to close the casket, these pall bearers will usher them out of the way to do the work that they have been called to do. But this widow kept her emotions in check. Jesus was on the scene, and the pallbearers could have pushed Jesus out of the way. The pallbearers could have said, not right now, Mr. Jesus, but she allowed herself to not let the emotion behind her feelings get in the way. She wept, but she didn't become emotional. She didn't say, move out of the way, Mr. Jesus. I got a son to put in the ground. Because had she had said that, she would have missed her miracle. She moved her emotion out of the way. She allowed her situation to be dictated by Mr. Jesus. Here comes Jesus, and he spoke to her. And the final point I have for you, the final thing I want to say to you, you got to observe the word. The word says Jesus saw her and had compassion. He had to do something about what he was seeing. He knew that she had lost everything. She had already lost her husband. She had already lost her son. Now here comes Mr. Jesus, and he sees her in this ugly situation, sitting at the gate of beauty. And Jesus had compassion. So he had to do something. And I'm telling somebody right now that when Jesus says, weep not, you can sign it, you can put it in the envelope, you can deliver it because your tears will be dried. Long came Mr. Jesus, weep not. Young man, I say unto you, arise and walk. And he arose and walked. And lest I forget why I'm talking, I said preschool was our primitive years. And yes, we learned how to play games. And yes, we learned our ABCs and our one, two, threes. But I can't forget old Miss Robinson. Old Miss Robinson would sit us in a group, sort of like we're doing right now. And she sit us down and ask us the hard questions. And in our finite minds, we couldn't find the answer. And we would sit there and give our answer after answer. And old Miss Robinson, when she got exhausted with the wrong answer, she would say, shh, put on your thinking cap. She would remind us to remember the lessons that she had taught us in the past. Oh, Miss Robinson would remind us to put on our thinking cap. And this morning, I'm just telling somebody to put on your thinking cap. When Jesus is at work in your life, you got to put on your thinking cap. Philippians 4, 8. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, 
Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, thank on these things. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Here it is, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Philippians 2.8. Therefore, being in the form and fashion of a man, he was obedient even to death, even to death on an ugly cross. So he marched up Calvary's rugged hill with a cross on his shoulders, not because he did wrong, but because I did wrong. He was dealing with my ugliness, but God said, this is my son. God said, I'm sending him for your sins. God said, he's sending him for your sins. So he went up to that cross and died an ugly death. He went down to a borrowed tomb, but early, Early on the third day, he got up with all power in his hand. All power in his hand. Therefore, God has exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue must confess that he is Lord. Revelation 5, why are you crying, John? The elder looked at John. Don't cry no more, for I see one, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. He came, he saw, he conquered, he broke the seven seals. Is there anybody here this morning that can see the Lion of Judah breaking the chains in your life? The Lion of Judah, who's breaking the chain of depression. The Lion of Judah, who's breaking the chain of your finances. The Lion of Judah, who's breaking the chains on your health. The Lion of Judah, who's fixing our children. The Lion of Judah, who can fix our city. The Lion of Judah, who he can place your problems in his hand. And he can be a leaning post to you. That he can lead you and guide you guide you and lead you, keep you and save you, till that day comes and we can be in his presence and he can say, well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast done thy job, now come sit with me in paradise, hey, hey. Dealing with ugliness. We all got to deal with it. But it's how we deal with it. God has put us in some ugly situations sometimes. But the question that he's asking today is are you willing to allow him to work on it? You can try to handle it in your finite power. And I'll be right here asking you where it got you. But you can place it in the hands of Jesus. And he can turn your mourning into dancing. As we stand, there may be one this morning who's dealing with 
some ugly situations. But I know a savior whom I can place all of my cares at his feet. He may not come when I want him, but I sure enough want him when he comes. His name is Jesus. And he died for your sins so that your tomorrows are so much brighter than your yesterday. Will there be one who wants to know Jesus, see him with their own two eyes, and allow him to save them from the depths of hell? everyone hallelujah hallelujah god bless you jesus said to the uppermost jesus says to the uppermost jesus said you up and turn you around hallelujah 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 jesus say it's tithing and giving time what kind of giver does God love? Is there anyone that needs an envelope right now? You can raise your hand. Our ushers will make sure you get one. If not, those in the balcony, if you can come now. As we stand on my right, My left. things and a 
of thine own have we given? And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only one wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Let every heart say.